The Lord be with you. And welcome to worship here at Main Street United Methodist Church on this uh, 4th of July weekend. I have to say that it is the single strangest 4th of July weekend that I can ever remember in my 44 years of life. Um, at the same time, I also know that there is so much for us to be thankful for, even in the midst of of a pandemic, even in the midst of what has been referred to as a double pandemic, there is so much to be thankful for. We are thankful for our freedom to worship as we choose. Uh, we are thankful uh, for family near and far, even those that we have seen at social distance, even those we haven't been able to see because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I am thankful uh, for apparently uh, every single person in Boonville finding something to spend their stimulus checks on. Uh, because based on the amount of fireworks that went off uh, yesterday, starting at about 3.30 in town, I think everybody spent their entire check at the fireworks store. So uh, we are just, just thankful to be here. I don't know, um, for folks who are worshiping in the live stream, I do believe that we may have a new record of number of folks in the pew. It is, it is starting to see, look not full, um, but, uh, but folks are gradually trickling back. We have some folks that have been here every single Sunday, others who are here for the first Sunday, uh, and we welcome you, and we also welcome all those uh, who are worshiping via live stream. It is just good to be the body of Christ together on this 4th of July weekend. I want to explain uh, to you one thing that is going to happen in this service for the first time uh, in quite a number of months. We are going to be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion. Uh, and so this is how it's going to, it's going to feel, it has been, it has felt strange preparing uh, for this. Uh, it may feel strange, it will feel strange uh, to be, uh, to be participating in communion uh, if you're in person. It may seem strange to be watching, uh, watching other people participate in communion. Um, and so just want to start out by saying this is different um, and that's okay uh, because that's what it needs to be for now. So when we come time to celebrate communion, we have a, a very um, simplified liturgy. So just the great thanksgiving, the part that starts the Lord be with you and also with you. Uh, when, that is, when, when we have come to the end of that prayer, then, then I will break the bread and break the juice, um, which is here. Don't worry, I'm, it's going to look like I have my fingers all over your bread. Uh, don't worry, that's not what you are going to be consuming. We also have on the altar a number of, of individual pieces of bread in Dixie cups. And so after the, the service is over, uh, Julie is going to come up quickly uh, and, and get that bread and take it back to the 5th Street entrance. And then as you leave, you'll leave by the 5th Street entrance, and Julie will give you a piece of bread in that individual Dixie cup. Um, and what we're asking you to do is to return to your, if you've, if you've driven here, to return to your vehicle, um, take off your mask and take a moment to, to, uh, to receive the, the bread reverently. Um, I found out the name for the, the church doctrine that says that in um, particular situations like this, uh, people ha can, can participate fully in communion without receiving the juice. Uh, it is called the doctrine of concomitance. So chalk that up to one more thing that you will probably never have to know until the next time we have a global pandemic, which hopefully will be never in our lifetime. Uh, but if we do, you will know the doctrine of concomitance. So um, I am thankful, I am deeply thankful uh, always for the privilege as a pastor of being able to, to celebrate the sacrament of communion with God's people. Um, and I am newly thankful today uh, that, that even in the midst of a global pandemic, even when we come in wearing masks and many people are still at home, even at a time when, when it seems like the world is conspiring to do everything that, that, that the world can to keep God's people from worshiping God, even still, we sit at the table and we say, we remember that Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. I don't have any idea how to transition out of that, but I've got one more thing to tell you, uh, which is that, that Julie and the boys and I are gonna, gonna be heading off to Northern Michigan for a couple of weeks of vacation. Um, we are going to be secluding ourselves in Julie's uh, family hunting cabin. Uh, we're gonna get a chance to visit Julie's parents during the day outside their house. 
uh, which is we haven't seen them in a good long time, so we're excited about that. Betty Dillingham will be the emergency, who is one of our lay leaders, will be the emergency contact person uh, during the time that we're gone, uh, during hours that the office is not open, um, and we will send that uh, her contact information out by email um, probably tomorrow. So um, I hope that things go well. We've got a very exciting next Sunday. Uh, Ju <laughs> next Sunday, Julie is going to be preaching uh, via video. Um, and then the Sunday after that, Tammy Gisselman, who is a former pastor of Main Street United Methodist, a beloved former pastor of Main Street United Methodist Church, is going to, to be preaching. She's back in, in southern Indiana uh, and just uh, delighted to hear, uh, to, to hear what it's like to get a chance to be worshiping with her again. So uh, we will see you uh, after a couple of weeks of, of rest and, and seeing family. Well, that's, uh, that's what I've got. And so uh, we have an, an exciting thing now for the kids. So if there are kids uh, in the sanctuary or kids uh, in the live stream, we've got a video for you. So if you want to get up and move around a little bit, this is a good chance to get your wiggles out and praise God. And grown-ups if you want to do that too. So I have to tell you that there were not a lot of people in the pews jumping up and dancing around. Uh, so I would guess that there might have been at least one or two folks uh, in their homes jumping up and down. I know I would have been, so I was going a little bit. Um, if you uh, have not had a chance, uh, if you were watching or participating via the live stream, if you have not had a chance to check in yet and let us know that you're worshiping with us, uh, go ahead and do that now. Just say um, your name and how many people are, are uh, worshiping in your place of shelter. Uh, if you are here uh, in, in person, uh, if you would just be willing to turn to your neighbors and greet them with our Christian pandemic wave.
our centering moment for the day uh, is the, the Apostles' Creed, which is one of the foundational uh, documents or creeds of our, of our faith. Um, we are towards the end of confirmation for this year. It has been a most unusual confirmation. It was done uh, half in person, then the pandemic struck, and the, the second half has been just finished up recently uh, via, uh, via Zoom. Uh, we are going to have, mark your calendars if you haven't already, on July 25th, Saturday, we are going to have the, ki- the, the kids, I keep calling them kids, they're not kids anymore, the, the, uh, the youth who are participating in confirmation are going to be at an all day, um, sort of off and on all day, uh, retreat on the green space on July 25th, and at the end of that retreat, we will have the service of confirmation outside on the green space so everybody's parents and grandparents and friends can come all at the same time. The really exciting thing about that is there's room on that green space for you. And so uh, if you would like to come and be a part of probably the only confirmation uh, service that will ever take place in exactly this way at Main Street United Methodist Church and support an incredible bunch of confirmands who have persevered uh, in circumstances that we never would have imagined even uh, of January this year, much less when confirmation started. Um, would encourage you to come and be a part of that service. Uh, we'll gather at 3.30 on the 25th, uh, and, uh, and we will confirm them, and we will praise God for, uh, for the way that God is growing our young people in faith. Uh, and so if you are a confirmand and you are participating in this service from home, I know that you have memorized the Apostles' Creed, and so you won't even need to to look at the words on the screen. Um, But if you, it's been a while, and so maybe you need to to have a little refresher, uh, they'll be up on the screen. I would say for those who are uh, worshiping in the service too, it may be handy if you have a smartphone to have have Facebook up um, and the the service going, because we have the words to, to the centering moment and other uh, in the, in the um, live stream. We're, we're not able to give bulletins because we don't want to pass you COVID along with your bulletin. Um, so I, I, one of the things that it occurs to me um, is that may be an opportunity in the future to have, um, to have words up on the screen. Um, and so I will get working on that. Um, we are learning as we go, and I am talking as I think. Um, so why don't we go ahead and have the centering moment together, uh, the, our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not know what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of God for the people of God.
as we move into a time of congregational prayer, I want to remind you um, that we do have a designated uh, prayer email, MainStreetPrayers at gmail.com. And what we're asking is, regardless of how you're planning to participate in the service, uh, whether you're planning to participate from live stream, whether you're planning to come to the 10 o'clock service, whether you're planning to come to the 1 o'clock service, if you have a, a prayer concern or joy to share with the congregation, we're asking that, that, you would, um, that you would send that via the email into the office. We will compile them, and then everybody, no matter how they participate in the service over the course of the day, uh, will be able to hear all the, the prayers. Um, here are the prayers that we have received for this week. Uh, prayers for the family of Donnie McCool. Uh, Donnie was the youngest son of Howard and Opal McCool, and we have a number of folks who loved him um, and are grieving him in the congregation with us today. Uh, as well, I know, as others who are participating via the live stream. Uh, prayers for Sylvia Davis, uh, who is really struggling hard with her, prayer, with her health. Um, and also prayers uh, for, the, for Sandy Hartz's family. And some clarity on that. Um, that, that prayer request was worded a little bit differently. Sandy's okay. Um, she was just asking for additional prayers uh, for her family. They've been, been going through a lot lately. Um, that's what I have received. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Won't you pray with me? Holy God, on this 4th of July weekend, we give thanks. We give thanks for your continued guidance and protection over our nation and our world, especially in these days of COVID-19. And we give thanks for the way that you are guiding us as a nation through some conversations about justice and equality and what it means to be free that we have long needed to have. Guide us through these challenging conversations and lead us through these challenging and exciting and anxiety producing and frightening times and lead us into a better day in a better way. Make us, oh God, come out of this season in our nation's history better and stronger and more fully living into our best potential and our higher ideals. We pray for those who are sick, oh God, that you would bring healing. We pray for those who are lonely, that you would bring comfort. And we pray for those who despair, that you would bring hope. We pray these things in the name of, our, of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Uh, we are moving into a time now where we're providing some space uh, it, for you to, to bring your offering. A reminder, um, there are many ways uh, that, that, um, that are provided for you to give if you choose. Um, if you are worshiping via live stream, uh, we have, um, would invite you to, to give through the, the giving app. Uh, or through the website. Um, also, an, op an, an option uh, that many folks have been taking advantage of is, is, the, is the post, is the mail, and we're thankful for all those. Um, for those who are uh, participating in person, there is a, an offering plate, um, which is in the back or on the side here, um, and we're asking that, that if you have an offering that you would just drop it in, in the plate. Um, ag again, like the bulletins, this is a change from the way that we have done it before, and we're working really, really hard not to pass, um, not to pass the virus uh, along with the plates. So um, we had this past, uh, recently we had uh, VBS for the first time in Main Street United Methodist Church's history entirely online, um, and those continued ministries of the church and the, the opportunities to continue to reach folks with the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel uh, are, are due to your continued giving, and we're very, very thankful. So I invite you to, to, um, part, to enjoy the, the offertory at this time, um, and we give thanks uh, for the gifts that the music team brings as well.
Let us pray. God of wisdom and all good gifts, we bring our tithes and our offering to your altar, remembering that, like Abraham, you have blessed us to be a blessing to others. Remind us this morning that the gift of freedom that comes to Christ is also a gift not to be kept, but to be shared. Even as the world asserts that freedom is a ticket to go our own way, you make us free to be part of Christ's body in the world, connected and independent. May the way we, that we live and the way that we reflect that kind of freedom be a part of the way that we serve you. In Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen. So I want to talk to the kids for a minute. So if there is a kid that is uh, a part of, of, of your worshiping household and they have drifted away from the screen for a little bit, I would invite you to, to bring them back at this time because I want to talk to them a little bit. All right. You ready? So we are talking these days about the adventures of Abraham and his family. And you remember, we've been talking about Abraham. He's the guy. He didn't actually ever go like this, um, but we sang a song about him going like that. And he and his, his son, uh, Isaac, uh, and his wife, Sarah, and his grandchildren, Jacob and Esau, and all his family, they had all sorts of adventures that are told about in the Bible. And so today I was thinking, maybe we ought to take an adventure ourselves. What do you think about that? I know what you're saying. How can I go on an adventure with Pastor Greg when I'm here and he's there? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make an adventure together. You ready? All right. You're going to need to go like this. Okay, everybody go like this. Stretch out your arms. And the kids in the sanctuary, too, stretch out your arms. Maybe stretch out your legs. All right, you ready? Okay. So we, you know, the other thing you're going to need is you're going to need a space to walk back and forth. See, I've got a little space right here. And so if you've got a space in your house or your tent or wherever it is that you're, that you're wa participating in this service right now, all right, you need, to, uh, you need to get a little space if you can. All right? You ready? Here we go. We are going to go on our adventure and maybe, just maybe, we're going to see a big hill to climb. All right? So ready? We stretched out. So get ready to climb that hill. Can you climb that hill with me? Oh, my goodness, that hill is so tall. How tall is that hill? Really tall. Are you getting tired? <gasps> we're almost to the top. Keep going. Oh, made it to the top of the hill. Take a big, big breath. OK. Now there's a long flat space, and adventures are more fun when you're running, aren't they? And so run right across that flat space. All right, did you get to the other side of the flat space? What do you see there? I don't know about you, but I see a big swimming hole. Do you see a swimming hole? Mm-hmm, okay. So we're gonna swim through. All right, now we're at the other side of the swimming hole and it's getting on towards nighttime. All right, so we're going to sit for the night. And oh, it is such a cold night. So if you can just kind of huddle up like this and make it through the night. Wake up. It's time to wake up. Wake up. Everybody wake up, because we've got some more. We're going to go on some more running, OK? We're going we're gonna to get those night, night colds out. Oh, no. I see a lion. Do you see that lion? Oh, no. We're going to have to run really fast. All right. I think we're OK. We're almost done with our adventure. And I don't know about you, but I'm almost adventured out. Are you almost adventured out? Only thing is, we're at the top of a big, tall hill, and we need to get back to where we're going. And so we're going to have to parasail. All right, so put out your arms like this. Ready? And jump. All 
All right, we're getting ready to hit the ground, so go. <laughs> we made it back home. Thank goodness. I don't know about you, but there were some times on our adventure that I was very excited. Were you excited at some times in the adventure? Mm -hmm. There were some times when I was very scared, too, like when we saw the lion. Were you ever scared when you saw the lion? Mm -hmm. You knew that lion wasn't real? Are you kidding me? Well, did you imagine that you were scared? Yeah, me too. OK. And there were times when I was really lonely, when the night was so very cold and long. Were you lonely, too? No? You have other people in your house, too, that you made you not lonely? Well, that's good. I'm glad that you have folks that helped you be not lonely. That's good. Well, I was thinking about our adventure and thinking that that's kind of how it is with our life. There are some times in life when things are going really, really well, and we're just really excited about everything that's going on. And there are some times in our lives when we're really scared. And there might even be some times in our lives that seem really, really long and lonely. But no matter what, no matter what our, this adventure of life brings, the one thing that we know as followers of Jesus Christ is that God is always with us, always going on our adventure with us. And that makes me really hopeful and feel a lot better about whatever this adventure of life brings. Doesn't it for you? Let's pray. God, we're so thankful that you are always with us, always walking with us, um, that there is nothing that we can do, nowhere that we can go that you are not with us. God, I'm thankful for the children of this uh, church and this community uh, and, uh, and even beyond this, this world. And I pray that you would uh, bless and guide them, help them grow up good and strong in faith and love of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live. But you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today to the spring and said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going. I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. And she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Beth Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, Tell me, and if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the right hand or to the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse, along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain, gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lohai Roy and was settled in the Negeb. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up he saw camels coming. 
And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things he, that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The word of God for the people of God. Won't you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So every once in a while, I'll be at home at the parsonage, and our whole family will be together, maybe watching TV, maybe playing a game together, or maybe just sitting around. And I'll look at our boys, and I'll wonder where in the world the time has gone. I remember when they were born. I remember when they learned to walk, and now they're big and old and grown up. I can't help wondering, as I read the passage from Genesis for today, whether Abraham looked at his son Isaac and had similar thoughts on the day that he sent his servant off to find Isaac a wife. If you've been with us these last few weeks, you'll remember Isaac. He came to Abraham and his wife Sarah late in life, long after they figured they would never have children together and he brought joy and laughter into their lives. The relationship between Abraham and Isaac hadn't always been perfect. There was, for one thing, that episode on the mountain at Moriah, which neither of them brought up very much. But Abraham had tried to be a faithful follower, and Isaac had turned out well. Now it was time for Isaac to get married. And so Abraham looked around at him and considered the young women living in the land they had settled in and decided that none of them would do for Isaac. They didn't worship Abraham's God, for one thing. Instead, they worshipped idols made of wood and silver. But for another thing, although Abraham had lived in this land for a good lot of years, his heart was still back in his father's fields in the land of Haran, where he had lived for many years of his life. And so he called one of his servants, and he sent him on a mission. Take a few other men with you, and go to my country and my kindred, and tell them that I have a son named Isaac, and he is ready to get married. Well, the servant was willing, but he uh, had some questions. Very understandably, he asked, what if I find the right woman and I can't convince her to come back with me? What then? Abraham was quick with an answer. I am not sending my son back there. You do whatever you need to do to convince this young woman to come here with you. Now, it was undoubtedly the case that Abraham wanted to stay near home so that he could take over the family agribusiness one day, but he still seems awful quick to insist that Isaac not go back to the family compound to live. And the reasons for that may become clearer as the story continues. When we pick up with Abraham's servant in the part of the story that Katie read for us for today, he's in the home of the woman that he thinks might be the one for Isaac. He's sitting at a table, and he's telling her family exactly how he came to be there. He had brought several camel loads full of gifts and riches with him, and when he got to the city of Nahor, which is near Abraham's homeland of Haran, he stopped by a well at the time when the young women of the town were coming out to draw water from the well, and he began to water the camels. And as he did, he offered a prayer which is clearly the prayer of a tired and thirsty man. O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please give me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. I am standing here by the spring of water, yet let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also, let her be the woman to whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Now this is an artfully worded prayer. If God chooses to answer it fully and grant everything the servant has asked, Abraham's servant gets something to drink, someone else finishes watering his camels, and he completes his journey finding a prospective wife to bring back home to Isaac. As it turns out, one of the young women who comes down to the well to draw water is named Rebecca, the granddaughter of Abraham's brother. The servant asks for a drink from her container of water, 
Rebekah gives him a drink and offers to finish watering his camels. And as she draws water for the camels to drink, Abraham's servant quietly observes her, trying to decide whether this might truly be the woman that he has come to find. At last, he makes his decision. This woman is the one. So he pulls from his bag a nose ring made from a, a half an ounce of gold and two gold bracelets made of 10 ounces of gold each, which is some serious bling. He offers it to Rebecca and asks if there might be a place in her home for him to stay the night. Abraham's servant looks at Rebecca's father and brother and says, that is how I ended up in your house, sitting at your table, talking to you about whether I can bring Rebecca home with me to marry my master's son. Now, one of the people sitting around the table listening to the servant's tale is Rebecca's brother Laban. He's going to turn up again later in the book of Genesis. If you know when he turns up again, if you're uh, viewing through the live stream, uh, post it in the comment section of the live stream. If you are worshiping with us in person, just shout it out. When does Laban turn up again? Do you remember? Laban is a scoundrel and a cheat. He's not a very nice person, although he can act the part when it's convenient for him. Laban sees Rebekah coming in from the well laden with gold and decides he might want to spend a little time with whoever has given all this gold to her. When Abraham's servant arrives at Rebekah's house, he makes sure that the man feels very welcome. He unloads, Laban unloads the camels himself, maybe glancing in each sack to make sure and just see what other gifts they might be holding. He gives all the travelers water to wash their feet after the long journey. He puts some food on the table, and he sits down across from Abraham's servant to hear what the man has to say. Well, the servant of Abraham finishes telling his story, and he says to Rebekah's father and brother, look, just tell me right now whether I'm wasting my time. If there is no possibility that Rebekah is going to be coming back home with me, I'm going to keep on going to a different household. Laban's father and brother take about a half second to ponder all those bags full of who knows what that came in on the camels, and they tell Abraham's servant, I think our dear Rebecca will be only too delighted to become Mrs. Isaac. Abraham's servant goes back to his camels, brings out lavish gifts for Rebecca and the rest of the family, and goes to sleep having made plans to leave early the next morning. When the morning comes, though, Laban and Rebekah's father Bethuel have a different plan in mind. Let the girl remain with us a while, at least ten days. After that, she may go. Now, Abraham's servant is no dummy. He knows that if he lets them keep the gifts and send him on his way, he's never going to see Rebekah again. So they reach a compromise. They'll ask Rebekah and see what she wants to do. You can imagine the way that Rebekah's family words the question. Dearest Rebecca, surely you do not want to leave right now with this strange man and not have the chance to properly say goodbye to us and not take a few moments to remember all the fond times we had together before you go far away where we'll hardly ever see you again. Rebecca looks at her scoundrel father and her scoundrel brother who are using her as a way to cheat this man who might be her only ticket out of this crazy household and says, I'm out of here. And she hops on one of Abraham's camels faster than her family can say, hey, would you mind leaving those gold bracelets behind? When they get back to Abraham's home, Isaac and Rebekah get married. The covenant God has made with Abraham will continue for another generation, and all's well that ends well, until their son Jacob meets Rebekah's brother Laban, when he goes back to his ancestral homeland looking for someone to marry, and Laban tricks him into marrying not one, but two of his daughters. Did you guess right? That's where we'll see Laban again. But that is a story for another day. You know, there are a lot of ways that we could explain why Abraham's plan to find someone back home to marry Isaac was successful. We could point, for example, to Abraham's social status. The fact that he had servants that he could send a few of, his, of back to his homeland to find Rebecca. If he hadn't, he might not have been able to take time away from the flocks to go there himself, and Isaac might have ended up marrying a local Canaanite girl instead. We could also point to the greed that Rebecca's father and brother had, 
who were convinced that Isaac would be the perfect husband for Rebekah, not because of any personality trait of Isaac, whom they had never met, and not apparently because of the persuasive words of Abraham's servant, but rather by the gold that suddenly appeared on Rebekah's arms and face and the heft of the bags on the backs of all those camels, which hinted that there might be more, than, more where that came from. We could also point to the customs and assumptions of the culture that Rebekah and Isaac lived in, where women were basically sold by their fathers to their future husbands and rarely got much choice in the matter. Rebekah unusually was asked whether she wanted to go with Abraham's servant, but it was only as a part of an attempted swindle by her father and brother, which backfired. We could point to all those things, and they would all be right. They are all a part of the reason that Abraham's plan was successful. And if you only read this story from the Bible and nothing that comes before it and nothing that comes after it, we might even be convinced that they are the only reasons that Abraham's plan was successful. But a careful student of the Bible knows that there's also this other thing going on which is what Bible scholars sometimes call the meta-narrative of the Bible. Over the top of these individual lives and adventures and circumstances of the people in the Bible, God is also intervening. God is at work making things go a certain way at pivotal moments. God is at work advancing God's agenda for the generations of God's people. In addition to all those other ways that we could explain why Abraham's plan to find someone from back home to marry Isaac is successful, we could also point to God at work in the situation, guiding Abraham's servant's path, bringing Rebekah to the well at just the right moment, and even being in the midst of the conversation at Rebekah's family table, making it go just so. And it's the same in our lives. Sometimes things just work out in our lives. Two people meet and fall in love and get married. A job becomes available at just the right moment. Things fall into place, so a conversation you've been needing to have with someone was made possible. And when that happens, when everything comes together just right, there's almost always some very practical ways to explain why things worked out the way they did. We can point, for example, to the ways that you'd prepared in advance for the moment, taking classes or gaining skills, not knowing whether they would ever be put to use, or putting some money away just in case, not knowing what the just in case would turn out to be. You could point to other people's care for you, a school guidance counselor that made sure that you knew to dress up for a job interview, or a parent who insisted that you know how to have a hard conversation in a grace-filled way. You could also point to what one Christian author once referred to somewhat ironically as the cosmic lottery, the fact that you were born in America with a gender or skin color that opened a door for you that might not otherwise have been open. All of those things would likely be true. They would be reasons that things worked out the way they did. And also, you could point to God's hand at work, making things work out in the situation, causing unlikely people to come together at just the right time and circumstances to align at just the right moment. Do you have a situation like that that you can think of in your life history? If so, if you're participating via the live stream, go ahead and share it with others in the comment section on the live stream feed. If you're worshiping in person and you have one, uh, feel free to holler it out through your mask. If you can't think of one right now and you've got one, tell me after the service. I know that I have situations like that in my life, moments where things just worked out. And at some times in my life, I would have mostly explained them by the practical explanations, the societal reasons. At other times in my life, I would have mostly explained them by saying something like, well, God had a plan. Anymore, though, I'm not so sure that I can say one way or the other in any given situation. And I'm not 100% sure that it's for us to know completely. God has a plan for creation and for our lives. There is a divine story that encompasses each of our stories. And there are all these societal and practical undercurrents that shape our lives, some for the good and some for the not so good. And all of those things play a part when things work out in our lives. So anymore, in one of those moments where something in my life just sort of works out, when things come together in a certain way that turns out better than I could have expected, I do what Abraham's servant did. When he realized that the young woman who had come to the well 
and offered to give him and his camels a drink was the one that he had come to find. He gave thanks to God. He prayed. Now his prayer sounded like this. Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the way to the house of my master's tent. My prayers often sound a little bit more like this. God, I'm not sure what part you played in this. I'm not sure whether you made every bit of this happen directly or not, and I don't want to presume. But I know you're in control of my life in this world. And I know all good things are directly or indirectly from you. And I know this worked out really well, better than I would have expected. And so I'm thankful. And I'll leave it at that. And maybe that's a good place for all of us to be. Not completely sure about all the details. Not sure how directly God is involved uh, or isn't involved in making things turn out a, a certain way in any, any given situation. But definitely always thankful to God when things just go wrong. And so we move into a time that I am thinking in my mind of as the great pandemic first communion. Whether you are participating in person or participating via the live stream, whether you will receive the, the physically the sacrament or not, we know that, gra that God's grace abounds. Uh, God's grace abounds when we are able to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion, when we are not able to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion. We know that God's grace has abounded over these last four months, and we know that God's grace will continue long after we leave this place today. We will um, sh share in the, the sacrament through the, by praying the great thanksgiving. Um, Folks who are participating in the live stream, uh, that should come up. Um, I would, I can't remember if we took the, did we take the hymnals out of the pews or not? If you have, okay, if, if you have a hymnal there and you feel comfortable, um, there's not been anybody in the sanctuary for a week, um, feel free to, to, to uh, take a hymnal and turn to page 13 for the great Thanksgiving. If you do not feel comfortable doing that, um, feel free to follow along however you choose. It's actually not is it 13. Yeah, it is 13. Um, and we'll pray the great Thanksgiving together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to you, O Lord. Man, is it not good to say these words? And to pray this prayer after four months of not celebrating the, uh, the sacrament of communion as a church family. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You have brought us through so much. You have brought us through weeks of isolation weeks of illness, weeks of fear, and you have brought us to this place that we are right now. And God, we acknowledge that all of those things are not done yet. But we are thankful to be here in this moment. We are thankful to be worshiping together. We are thankful to be the body of Christ together. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by, the, by water and the Spirit. 
on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given to you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Now pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. This bread which we break, this bread which we share, is the body of Christ. And this cup over which we give thanks is the blood of Christ. I invite you now, as the music team plays our closing hymn, to silently reflect on uh, and prayerfully reflect on the gift that, that Jesus left for us in this meal that we, uh, that we call the Last Supper or Holy Communion. Uh, and at the end of the service, those who are worshiping in person, uh, as you depart, uh, Julie will have a piece of bread at the Fifth Street entrance that you can take and, and consume when you return to, to your vehicle.
after the benediction, if you are participating uh, in the service in person, there will be ushers who will come and, and dismiss you by row um, and invite you to, to head in the direction of the Fifth Street entrance. Um, if you need to use the, the elevator, um, just let one of the ushers know and they will make sure that, that you're able to do that. So now go from this place into God's great adventure, knowing that whatever good, whatever bad may come, God will be with you always. In the name of God, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.